Assalamu alaikum everyone, Yvonne here from My Hello Kitchen. As promised, we have a new interview for you up today, and I am very excited to be interviewing Timothy Hyatt of Islamic Services of America. Welcome, Tim. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. This is epic because you are one of the very first certifiers uh, to do an interview. So I am so excited about that. Thank you for agreeing to talk to us today. My pleasure. So Tim is coming to us from Arizona and he has a pretty interesting background. Let me introduce you to him formally and then we're gonna dig in to how he got into the certification business and what they do in this industry, which is really cool. Uh, Timothy Ab Abu Munir Hayat is the current Vice President of Islamic Services of America, or ISA, with its main office in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He has participated in many international halal seminars, conventions, expos, and training events, and met with many international halal certifiers and halal industry officials in Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and Jakarta, sort of the major centers for halal industry in the world. Timothy was born in England and grew up near New York City. He graduated from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science, a French minor, and international relations certificate. He spent two years teaching English with the Peace Corps in Morocco, where he met his wife and converted to Islam over 30 years ago. Timothy speaks fluent Portuguese and French and is conversant in Moroccan Arabic and Spanish. That's really cool. He served as a board of directors member, board secretary, and public relations committee chairman for the Islamic Center of Cedar Rapids, ICCR, for 12 years. He also represented Islam as a board member of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, Iowa, for six years, and as a board member with the Council for International Visitors to Iowa Cities. Timothy and his family currently live in the Phoenix Valley of Arizona, which is my neighbor. Very impressive, Tim. You have such a cool story. Well, thank you. I'm just blessed. What can I say? <laughs> so, so Morocco captured your heart and got you your wife and a whole new interesting life from there. Yeah, it was uh, it was meant to be. I mean, for anyone who believes in fate, um, <laughs> certain things and certain actions at a certain time will take you in one direction or the other, yeah. and uh, things could be very different. Um, if you're familiar with the butterfly effect, if I interpret it correctly from an old Ray Bradbury science fiction story, you know, if you if you kill a butterfly or step on it in the mud, it could change the entire course of natural history and the rest of mankind. So mm. um, it was a great story that I read when I was a young child. So it kind of left an impression and kind of bases why I, I'm grateful for what I have and that things could be very different based on other circumstances. But first and foremost, I want to thank you for this kind invitation. Uh, I do want to acknowledge for your new and existing guests and followers that you've been in this industry for a long time and represent more than just halal food. I mean, looking at your website um, and your Facebook pages and things like that, I mean, you, you touch on everything about halal, whether it's food and consumables to lifestyles and little bits and pieces of science and interesting things that um, make a difference in our lives. And so I think you're uh, very well accomplished, very well known. And I want to acknowledge that first and foremost and thanking you for being part of this, this program. Thank you. I'm honored uh, that you said that. Um, and, you know, just you being so receptive to this interview was very important to me. And uh, I had been wanting to talk to you for a long time. I I'm very impressed with the work you've been doing at ISA and your website there is, is something I want to dig into in the, in the interview because you're offering consumers way more than just uh, you know a label on products. You're offering lots of information as well about the industry and globally. So that's really attractive to me. And the fact that as a certifier, you're, you're so willing to talk about something that is so important to consumers I think really says a lot about the institution you represent. So I'm very excited for our audience that they're going to get a, a little glimpse into your world of what you do and you know how important it is for all of us to, to really know if our products are halal certified and why they need to be halal certified, which is something that sort of, it's kind of like something that stays in the industry, 
but I think it's something consumers need to understand as well. I think it's important to be an open book um, mm -hmm. on a lot of matters. And for those who are inquiring, uh, if people have open eyes, open ears, mm -hmm. open hearts and open minds, they'll be receptive to learning. And it's a choice. It's a choice whether you want to learn and, and understand more. And in other ways, um, information is important and details or information. Sometimes people just want the quick and down and dirty. Yeah. What does it take? What is it about? I don't need to know all of this. But we have a wide range of uh, a large audience of people who need to know this from manufacturers and consumers and supply chain partners. So Exactly. And what's interesting is you and I have something in common is that we um, we're both very interested in sort of culture and international affairs. And then we both converted to Islam and then our paths took us into the halal industry. So if you don't mind, would you share with us how you went from like being a Muslim, a new Muslim, and then eventually getting into the halal industry? Like, how did that happen for you? That's so interesting to me to know. Well, when you come back from uh, overseas with a new wife and a new child, you have to reestablish your life and your mm, yeah. um, ability to provide for a family. And I started as a temp at GE in the finance department. And next thing you know, I had a, a nice long career with them. And then I moved on to a telecommunications company. So I remained in the finance world for a little bit and then had the opportunity to uh, join Midamar, a uh, halal branded product company as an export and documentation manager for their products and their supply chain business. So um, I'm very diligent and detailed when it comes to documentation and notes and SOPs. Yeah. And then it led to uh, my experience with ISA, um, where I, and then more recently, the vice president after about 12 years. Congratulations. That's a, a step up and, and an important role, you know, overseeing such a, such a large organization. And, you were in Cedar Rapids, right? Because Midamar is in Cedar Rapids, correct? Right. It was one of the stops along my uh, corporate path uh, of being relocated to various operating centers. And and then uh, rather than move again, uh, we stayed in Iowa, where it was a great place to raise children and affordable at the time. But uh, yeah, and then I met the, the, the Muslim community there, and I met the owners and founders of Midamar, and mm -hmm. the rest was history, so to speak. Yeah, and, and that's an important place in America for, for Muslims because that was one of the first, was it the first masjid in the U.S. was in Cedar Rapids? First, if not the longest lasting, still existing uh, places of worship for Islam, especially west of the Mississippi River. Right. So it's uh, more of a historical uh, landmark right now. But yes, the Mother Mosque is in Cedar Rapids. It has a yeah. history of itself as well. Yes, when the Syrian and... Um, other Middle Eastern folks from that area came and congregated, both Muslim and Christian. Right, right. Um, you know, they had neighborhoods there and they had neighborhoods here. So, yeah. Right. And I had, because I, when I had uh, talked with Midamar years ago when I was in Chicago, they had told me the story. And I thought, you know, that was when I was quite new too. So that, that history is really, really interesting. So, um, yeah, that's an important part for it. Maybe a lot of young Muslims might not know that. Um, but uh, so so you go from Midamar to certification business. So from the poultry chicken, the halal poultry business to certification business. What was that jump like? And how did you, you know, what experience did you have along the way, um, you know, up to being vice president? Well, I think based on my my corporate training and toolkit of skills and abilities and communication uh, traits, it was not difficult to transition to a business that required structure. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are halal standards that need to be maintained. And we'll yeah. talk more about that a little later. But yeah. uh, detailed SOPs are, are very, very important. And being a Muslim, uh, understanding what halal is, because it's more than it's, it's a way of life. It's more than just food. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that, too. Yeah, so so um, ISA, Islamic Services of America. Uh, how? So you weren't there when it first started, correct? You you were you came in when it was already established. Correct. I was only fifteen when uh, back in 1975 it started. So I I didn't know yeah. what ISA was at the time, but our history can be found on our website www.isahalal.com, and 
uh, I can just jump in and tell you a little bit about how and why it was started. It was primarily uh, started as an outreach support mechanism for Malaysian and other Muslim overseas students attending Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa and the University of Iowa in Iowa City. And it then evolved really for uh, for these students and those those types of consumers when the need for halal products became a vital part of their survivability, for lack of a better term, because halal wasn't wasn't easy to find. And it was back to the basics of what's halal and what's not uh, based on their own upbringing. So that's a little bit about the history of how ISA started. I feel like the influx of college students around the country kind of facilitated a lot of growth in in the Muslim community, but particularly in halal, because what's the first thing people are looking for is food, right? Students are looking for halal food. And so, today, Muslim student associations and universities are working very closely together to establish those um, requirements and uh, options for students in their catering on the on-campus uh, meal right. system. So um, right. they they try to they're doing a really good job in a lot of places and. There's a lot more work to be done, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The college and university campuses are, are huge. There's such a demand. And from what I understand, that because a lot of them are close to hospitals, um, you know, they, they become even more important because a lot of Muslim doctors are coming into the campuses to eat on, you know, the halal food. So that's really interesting. There's so mm-hmm. much demand. Mm-hmm. So tell us, okay, so for consumers who are looking at products, They see this certification label on meat. They understand, okay, yes, this means that someone has vetted this meat to be halal, whether that's hand slaughtered or not. We can talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about other things like water or uh, certain drinks, other drinks or product, vegetable, you know, uh, snacks, products that don't have meat. What is it that, because I've heard a lot of consumers say, eh, that doesn't need to be halal. They're just trying to make money off of this, but they really don't understand some of the intricacies of that, the whole holistic process of bringing, you know, foods to market. So can you tell us about perhaps some products that you do certify halal that are not meat related and why you certify them halal? Certainly. Um, I think that that's an important concept that most people, whether they were born and raised and then came from the Middle East or other uh, Muslim countries in the Southeast Asia or, or Africa, North Africa, or anywhere, um, they grow up with what's halal and they know that their meat was slaughtered according to Islamic law. And they know that there isn't pig uh, or pork products next to another product in the open market or at the butcher. So these things don't really come into play when they're thinking about what's halal and what's an easy decision for them to make, of course, uh, not consuming alcohol, but there are uh, there's the hamar, the, the drinking alcohol that will cause inebriation. And then there's the more chemical synthetic reaction of ethyl alcohols. And that's a deeper topic as to what could or couldn't be in a product because they're, they act as a carrier, as a solvent. They evaporate during cooking. So there's a lot of things as to the ethyl alcohol that come and go. But yet there still has to be only a minimum residual amount left in the finished product. But to talk about water or air filters and things that people would say, that doesn't need to be halal certified. We don't make the rules. We just follow them and we apply them based on customer needs, client needs, um, regional needs, export needs. Malaysia is probably the only country that I know of right now that actually certifies bottled water. Okay. And that is because it's water. It's water. But water tastes differently, right? It depends where you source it from and you want it to be clean and pure, but how do you get to that clean and pure stage? You have filters. And then what are the filters made out of? Are they made out of uh, animal bone? And so the animal bone for even bleaching of sugar, there's to give it that white color. There's, there's so many things behind the scenes that people do not understand um, until they hear it or ask about it. And I'll give a quick plug for our blogs which I know you want to ask about later on too, but our blogs cover a wide range of topics from everything from consumable products to non-consumable. Why is halal important? How does halal apply in this industry? Uh, What are the various aspects of it and their applicability? 
But once again, water is has a little halal logo by Jakim in Malaysia because it has been vetted. It has gone through a process that people have assured there's no chance of anything foreign in it. And again, it's because somebody asked for it. And if they contact us and want something halal certified, we say, absolutely, let's help us. Let's help you get there. Yeah, when I was doing the research for my second book, that's when I really got deeper into the topic of what's really in our food. And it wasn't really just what's in the food itself, but it was also the packaging um, and the and the and the manufacture or the processing, like the conveyor belts of which food comes on, or the oils that can drip from. And some people might think that this is minutia; it's not really that important. But if if you if you are putting your name on something and saying that it's halal through and through, you have to make sure that that entire process is halal. And what people don't seem to understand is that, you know, there could be a pork product on a conveyor belt before your nice halal product was was on that conveyor belt. Or um, now there there's all kinds of technology coming out, right, where they spray packaging with uh, lard, or right. There's certain things that happen that you wouldn't really think would happen in food food industry, but when I saw I saw um, uh, Jewish uh, vendors at a packaging show, and I and I had asked them, you know, like why is some of it kosher, and they explained to me, and I'm like, well, because we have similar needs when it comes to monitoring and vetting and all that transparency, right? So interesting. Mm -hmm. The name of the game in the real term is uh, diligence. I mean, you have to prove that what you've done uh, followed a formula for the certification. And once again, we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, when you prompt me. But otherwise, there is a flow. There is a process. Traceability is an important word. You talked about segregation. You talked a little bit about sanitization, that a production line has to be fully sanitized before a halal product or a halal certified product runs through it. The right. product that ran on that line may not be certified as halal, may be perfectly halal, but in order to say that we know it was controlled before, during, and after from the raw material receipt at a warehouse where it's segregated from anything that's not halal, especially if it's got anything uh, that's stacked on top of it in the warehouse that could have a DNA um, transfer, okay? Right because there's DNA transfers and detecting levels of uh, porcine materials. Um, documents have to, that we receive and request from customers, have to show the ingredients from start to finish. We do visit and audit the facilities to make sure everything is good from start to finish. So uh, once again, segregation, uh, scientific testing. And here's another aspect of Halal is that it's a combination of science and religion. Yes. And religion really comes first. But there is a science that follows in order to abide by the religious aspect of it to understand. Yes. I gained an entirely new appreciation for food scientists when I did the research for my book. Well, it was even before that because I was in the Chicago community and uh, working uh, amongst a lot of other people in the industry. And I, and it was the first time I'd ever heard of a food scientist. scientist. And what do they do? I didn't really understand. I thought maybe they were you know, in labs, you know, concocting stuff that, uh, you know, they could, be. They could be. But they, there are so many in our Muslim community, thankfully, because they really understand sort of the intricacies of what goes into uh, food that is processed and engineered and all of that, which is just a reality of what, what we have today. We don't have food that is, you know, just what it says it is, right? We Food is complicated today. And that's another reason why I tell people, Sometimes we can't imagine what happens in food because we, we we don't we're not in that world of of food science or you know the concoctions that are being made to, you know for 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 food to be preserved and shelf stable and all of that. So sometimes some stuff you just can't think up in your head. You wouldn't it's, imagine. It's called reading labels, and who understands what is on a label? Reading those <laughs> ingredients, um, the smart shoppers will. Okay. Right. And what is polysorbate 80? What is E120? These are things that are either preservatives or colors. And right. where did that color come from? Did E120 
Right. Who knows where E120 came from? It came from, comes from the cochineal insect, which gets the red dye, which can be used in stra in strawberry yogurts or, or other right. colors. So right. people don't normally look at that and they don't care. But those who will know, and I want to throw out um, this comment that I've always said is that Malaysians are among the most sophisticated hello consumers because they have a, a dire, strong need, uh, thirst and hunger, literally no pun intended, to know what they're consuming. They want to know if it's halal, even if there's a halal logo on it. And I do want to talk about that a little bit because Please if do. there is the halal certification mark on a product such as our logo here, let me point to it here, and uh, our background has a few different logos from our companies that help identify that it's a halal product. And it's important to know that a generic halal in Arabic and English is not traceable to who the certifier is. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And that traceability, that transparency is so critical because in a way, if someone just like, what people probably don't understand is that I can create a product tomorrow and I can just put a Arabic symbol halal and it can go to market like that. There's no regulation for that, right? Except in Canada. Okay. Canada is at the forefront where they've actually said that it, it is a law that it must state who the certifier is or be identifiable as to who the certifier is. Um, no one wants to throw the word fraud around, but it can happen. And uh, people can manipulate a certificate. They can add a logo, pull it from the website and throw it on their packaging and think nothing of it, or they could be more malicious, okay? But they think, well, I know that it's halal compliant, so it's only a potato, okay? But, you know, carrots and potatoes and their natural sense when you pull them out of the ground, they're halal by nature. But as soon as you go through a process, you turn it into a carrot juice, you start adding preservatives, you add sugars, you add you you add cooking oil to French fried right. potatoes that are frozen and ready to cook. What's right. preserving it? What was used in it as a seasoning? It takes okay. it, it, it's no longer the standard halal by nature. Exactly. Exactly. It's a really fascinating world actually. And that's why I feel like when um a certifier such as yourself is so willing to talk and so transparent that that gives me a lot of comfort as a consumer to buy the products that have your 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 label on it because I know you're reachable. I can call you or contact you. I you have an amazing website which I want to get into. But that makes me comfortable as a consumer because people are I think Muslim consumers are pretty good at reading labels they, they want to know i mean and we're dissecting all these lab kind of you know this vocabulary that's out there i tend to tell people well, in the beginning i used to tell people just get the most natural product as possible that way you avoid all of that because i myself didn't know enough at that time now that i know more i'm a little bit more like okay i i understand what some of that is and it's fine some of it i would just avoid but you know it's a lot of work <laughs> for us to do. But that's why your business is, revolves around your Halal kitchen. Right. And my, we talked about this too offline earlier that uh, my wife is a phenomenal cook and she makes everything from scratch. We ever so rarely eat out, not just because of the cost and the quality and the taste and safety. Yeah. Um, it's just not the same, although she certainly deserves a break and I can only chop so much as a sous chef, but she <laughs> makes the magic happen. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a real... It's a big deal, but today with society and people are in a hurry, they want to be able to pull something off the shelf, ready to eat, ready to consume, something that's easy because uh, everyone's on the run and on the move. But the halal certificate gives the the product that trust factor, as you said. It is traceable to the certifier, and we can we we field consumer emails and calls even for products that do or don't have our logo on it. They want to know is this product halal? And it's like, well, do you see a logo on it? Okay, tell me more. Send us a photo. Um, send me the ingredient list. Let's let's see what we can determine and make the best judgment on it if it is not um, formally certified. So it's important to ask questions and go to the right people who can answer them as quickly as possible because we have people standing in the store. They're in the aisle and they're asking me this question, okay, or any of us who answer the phone. So. Well, and it's not just convenience, right? It's there's 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 needs, right? We have nursing homes, we have colleges and universities, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. we have hospitals, we have humanitarian aid that needs to be halal certified to Muslim countries, right? And Muslims that are you know displaced, 
that's something that I'm very passionate about because, you know, they, they also need to have halal food, you know, as part of the, you know, respect of their beliefs and uh, um, dignity. So, mm-hmm. so it's such a huge service that you're providing, even just fielding questions, even if, you know, they're not for your products. But um, that, that just brings me to just taking a look at your website. Um, well, I want to get back to the products in a second, but let's, let's jump to your website for a second. You uh, have a blog there now, and uh, I love it because it really provides lots of information on various aspects of the halal industry, such as pharmaceuticals, for example. So why did you decide to, because that's a lot of work. It's a lot of extra work aside from our, the business you're in. So why did you decide to take on such a, I think it's a big role because I do blogs all day long. So <laughs> why did you decide to do that? Well, first I'd say that it's um, it's a continuation of the outreach concept mm-hmm. um, as a form of dawa as well for, for halal consumers, whether they're Muslim or not, mm-hmm. uh, for manufacturers and uh, the general public to kind of learn a little bit about how easy it is to understand what halal is and how it plays in various aspects of our life. So once again, whether it's supplements more so than pharmaceuticals, because that implies more of an actual medication that you get a prescription for, um, you know, whether it's um, the Menvio vaccine or right. even COVID vaccines. And, right. and then that's another whole uh, topic about whether or not it's um permissible to have a porcine ingredient in a life-saving medication, exactly. which becomes the term, and I'm not a scholar, but uh, Daruri, I think it's called, where it's uh, you have no choice if you want to survive and you you really, really, really have to have it in order to uh, to survive something really, really bad. So, But once again, it, it, it presents um, the wide range of what Halal products cover. Um, our president, Jalal Asi, is a visionary in many ways about the growth of not only our business, but uh, serving our customers and the consumers and in a global mindset. So having our uh, halal news and information in a simple, relatable way for our clients and people to visit um, is really important to have it readily available. So the range is quite, ri- uh, quite wide, and I would direct people to the top right of our main website, and we'll talk about halal news, information, blogs. And you yeah. can click on that. We publish those every week. So. I, I put the uh, the link for people to, to look at. And actually, someone is asking about it, too. So that's great. So hopefully, they're looking at it now. Um, and Umar, Umar Ahmed is asking a question that I, was my next question, which is about certification for products other than food. So what other types of products do you certify or are certifiable? Well, we did talk about how limited uh, the scope is for some people just thinking it's about no pork, no alcohol, and that it has to be halal slaughtered animals Mm -hmm. uh, that are permissible and slaughtered according to Islamic law. But um, there are the things such as non-consumables like cosmetics, what you put on your skin, Mm -hmm. uh, nail polish, hair color, okay, because they can go into the follicles of of your head. They can go into your bloodstream. They're directly applied to your skin and or, you know, you can't make your wudu if the if the nail polish isn't um, soluble or permeable, I should say. Um, chemicals, cleaning agents, filters. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of our some of our customers, but there's one that that's here in Arizona called Decon 7. And it was a, a sanitizer company that just grew exponentially upon the outset of COVID. And there was a great demand and need for the sanitizers on surfaces oh, in right. schools or in fire departments and hospitals, right. because everyone thought you could get it just by touching us and licking, you know, <laughs> licking your finger after touching something. So, but sanitizers are really important. They've been around for a long time. Everyone used to carry one in their car, in their handbag and sanitize their hands. I, I, I don't like to think I'm too OCD, but I do like to, I don't like icky feeling on my hands and I'll wash my hands just because it feels better, not not to mention yeah, that it's healthier. <laughs> but uh, there was a great demand also from overseas for air filters uh, and things that people are breathing. And that while it's non-consumable, it is affecting something that you would inhale. And it's a fairly simple process. Great and we didn't say you have to have it, but if people want it and there's a manufacturer who can make it, 
they're going to seek that certification to widen their growth opportunity okay. in marketing and sales and serve a, a, a global purpose. So it's really, 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 really interesting as for the how, whys, and why nots, and let's do this or not. So I feel like more and more companies that I've seen, well, especially in the food industry, that were not um, halal before are now rethinking having at least a portion of their products be halal certified or making them all certified halal because that, in a sense, I mean, everybody can have it. It's not excluding anybody. Have you seen a growth in that too? Well, we have customers that only seem to seek the certification for one or two products in their entire line of products yeah. because once again, somebody asked for it. Mm -hmm. So if a buyer comes to them as part of a supply chain that needs this ingredient or finished product to be halal, they only do that. Others have uh, looked at the big picture, bigger picture and said, well, I'm going to have everything I do halal certified. And it depends what the product is. Is it a beverage? Okay. Is it a filter? Is it a meat product? Is it something that, um, you know, it, it's based on marketability and marketing savvy. If you know how to market your business, you will make it work for you. We, we encourage people to use our Hello logo on their website or talk about the Hello certification. We give them our logo to put on their website. We ask for their logo to put on our website. I it's love free that. Advertising. It's free advertising. It's value added. This is what we do. We encourage it because it, it again, proliferates into the market to say this yeah. product is Hello. Okay. Hooray. And word of mouth, that's how you do it. And then other countries and export opportunities for um, the places that want it because American products are great, because American standards are great. You have OSHA, you have FDA, you have USDA. You have a lot of protections in place that there's 92 tons of um, some kind of bacon product that was recalled due to possible metal in them. Oh, my God. And you know, they don't wait and try to look for that one pound of product they recall the entire batch. So recalls are really a big deal because it's a safety hazard. Even if it's only in one product, they wipe it all out. It's staggering. And that was a news item I saw today. Yeah, and I get those news too. And I am staggered at how, uh, how many recalls there always are. You can get the updates all the time and in the food industry, it's like, wow. And then I'm calling my family. Like, it's not as rare as you think. It's not as no, rare as you think. It's not. But the ones that really have an effect are when uh, lettuce grown in um, in a vegetable producing area has salmonella. Yeah. And that affects a lot of people very quickly. Yes, very exactly. quickly. It's, it's really common. because it's just proliferated through the uh, the food chain and the food supply. So, but anyway, that talks about some of the things that we do, whether it's cleaners, chemicals, things that you don't uh, ingest, but uh, anything, almost anything except pork and alcohol based. Uh, products can be halal certified to answer that question. Well, I love what you said about the marketability and that, and that factor and how you're asking companies that you certify for their logos and exchanging. Because when I first came into this industry, that was the first thing I thought of was, oh my gosh, you know, products that are halal certified should be, you know, just singing to the top of the mountains <laughs> for some of the, mm -hmm. but that wasn't happening. And I don't know if it was a bit of Islamophobia way back then. This is, I'm talking 14 years ago. Um, but a lot of companies kind of wanted to stay quiet about it. And a lot of the certifiers were kind of like, you know, we're not in the business of marketing. And I mean, I respect that, but it, it was always baffling to me because I just came at it from a point of, you know, halal, we need to um, elevate it. We need to market it. We need to, to normalize it. For people who don't understand it and to make it as prolific in the American grocery stores as possible because there's a huge demand and it's great for people. And you now that was my passion kind of, you know, idea, but um, you're probably one of the first people I've talked to in the industry who's, who said that. Well, unfortunately the hello market, um, not the industry so much, but the marketability of hello products is, is way behind the kosher yeah. industry. Yes, exactly. Okay. And exactly. if you're talking about sheer numbers of uh, upwards over 1.5 billion Muslim consumers in the world of anywhere from 12 to 25 million Muslim consumers in the USA, it's really hard to get ideal statistics, but 
Um, it is growing and it's growing exponentially in America, but you know, people buy products that are kosher certified. They're not looking for the kosher mark. No. They're buying the product. And if yeah. they happen to see it, oh, bonus, I guess that's okay. I, because the number of Jewish consumers or practicing Jewish consumers is, is quite small, but right. they're extremely successful on getting it on products and, and people will market. And then you have the, maybe the Islamic phobic side of things that people don't want to draw a great deal of attention to their hello certification. And I think um, our population, especially since it's hard to believe 9-11 was t over 20 years ago, that, um, People have a better understanding of what Islam is, I hope, I think. I think so, too. Um, that, that's a whole other demographic because I did a lot of that sort of thing with communities, non-Muslim communities, to talk about Islam from um, from a convert's, revert's perspective and, and talking in basics that they understood. Um, and that more importantly, you know, what does a Muslim look like? I mean, you know, do they have to have a beard? Do they wear a, a kufi? Do they wear long robes? They could be anybody. They could be anybody that you're standing next to and we're just like anybody else you know we just have a different dietary and religious aspect uh, of our lives but it shouldn't shouldn't scare anybody or cause a reason for xenophobia no and i think it, i always say you know food is that one thing that neutralizes the conversations when things get too electric and and you know our muslim community does a really good job of proliferating restaurants in this country. who doesn't like falafel or euros or I mean, we do. Who make doesn't like that stuff? They, they don't even associate whether it's a religion or a diet. It's right. delicious and it's halal bonus. Yes. I, I remember the first time I, I went back to Washington, D.C. after I became Muslim and I came out of uh, the subway station. And the first thing I saw when I came out was a halal food truck. And I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. This was so, it was like, it was like, I don't know how the feeling I had, but it was just, amazing you know like of all the things that have happened in this country you know god bless the food truck where you know entrepreneurs and and the restaurant entrepreneurs because they have just been plugging away and just saying very loud and clear my truck is halal especially <laughs> I, on those many street corners throughout manhattan yeah exactly i grew up with those i mean i was i, yeah. I grew up just outside new york and i i go to the city every once in a while i was an hour and 20 minutes away you go to a, a show or a museum or whatever the case, just as kids. And, you know, who wouldn't grab a hot dog on the corner with uh, with all those goodies? And, and I'm right. sure it exists in Chicago and other places. But New and York I, was the home and origin of food trucks or carts, well, I should say. Well, then there was the halal guys, you know. I, I In the same weekend that I went to the Martha Stewart show, I had the halal, food, the, the halal guys. And I thought, well, this is something you know, special. Who would have thought? But we, you know, it was kind of that motivation to like keep going because if there's one country in the world that I believe on this planet that can, can that can break through and make something like lemonade out of lemons is in America, and you know I think we've done that in the halal space, halal food space. I think we're doing it. So I'm, you know, for for all the intents and purposes, I think. Um, Hello Food is kind of moving that needle forward and pushing through a lot of stuff, which I feel things are getting better. Don't, don't you? I do. I, I really do. And once again, this is not something we force. This, no. is, something that we, this is something we facilitate. Yeah, exactly. Okay? exactly. We're the facilitator for, uh, because it's good for the economy too. It's, sure, it's good course. for the American yeah. economy, for yeah. exports of products domestically and internationally to uh, get the products that people need, milk powder, dried milk powder in yeah. places where they don't have fields of cattle or wheat exactly. and things like that, uh, finished goods, raw materials, syrups, flavorings, aromas, yeah. whatever the case may be. Yeah, so you mentioned those things. So supply chain is very important in the halal space too, right? People think of, we're thinking of meat products and finished stuff, but also the, the ingredients or the byproducts that go into other food products are also very important. That whole supply chain being halal, that's a whole nother sub category of this industry that you're, you're working There's ingredients with. and there's sub ingredients. Yes. And then what is the source of origin? We, that's just part of our analysis. And I'll, maybe I'll just jump in right now and talk about the certification process flow. Please. Yes. But it, 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 it starts with somebody having a need and an interest. Mm -hmm. And they go to our website, they go to a few different certifier websites, they make some calls and invariably they'll, 
we'll go with uh, whoever answers first, gives them the information they're asking. And also what I like to do is give answers to questions they haven't thought of, that they haven't asked. I like to answer the unasked questions so that they have even more information to base a decision on. But um, pricing is part of it. Uh, ultimately, it's the service. It's the recognizability of um, you could have a local certifier. You could have one that's globally known. Uh, we have many colleagues in, in this industry who we know personally as well as professionally. We respect each other. There's plenty of business for everybody. And we're on the same page when it comes to these things. When we go to conferences overseas or in the industry and attend uh, more of these virtual conferences now about standards and things like that without getting on a plane, which I miss those, those opportunities. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. So uh, let's talk about scholarship. Um, do you refer to Islamic scholars for, um, you know, the per permissibility, for example, of a uh, cow slaughter is very sort of complicated. So one of the examples I have or the wine or alcohol issue, how do you get the, um, parameters of which you certify something as being halal within your understanding. Okay, I'll talk about standards a little more in a second. I'll just finish quickly because I failed to, to really continue the thought about after someone expresses an interest, they complete okay. an application, you get into a contractual service agreement, they understand the pricing and the terms and conditions, the duration and uh, some of the indemnifications and things that we need to represent for each other. Not a terribly long thing. If anyone's used to service agreements or contracts, terms and conditions, it it's, uh, falls along that. But uh, then we start obtaining the product list of things that they want to certify. We do a deep dive in the product review aspects. And these things are also explained on our website. But then we also do a facility audit. We want to know what's going on in the facilities. We have to witness it. We can't just take right. word of mouth. Exactly. Nobody uh, should be rubber stamping a certificate and say, Pay me this, I'll get you a certificate. Oh, it's halal, no problem. That, that that's, that's not the way to go. <laughs> it can, it happens, but I think less so because as as become as people become more knowledgeable and understanding the differences that we're talking about, the, they make smarter choices. Then after the audit, everything is either approved or has a non-compliance or non-conformance that, that we have to review and say you need to substitute this gelatin because it's not halal. Uh, right. You have to substitute that. Oh, this contains this. Even names of certain products, we can't call a beverage that contains no tequila, tequila sunrise special. You know, I, I'll suggest make it uh, tropical, tropical flavor, or tropical beach. <laughs> you know, come up with something that associate with the name, yeah. you know, of, of something great. that is not meant to be. That's great that you do that. I like that a lot. Once again, we don't just say no, we say why not and you know, what, what's wrong with it. And then yeah. in the end, they'll get their further, they'll get their annual certificate and we revisit the products. They can the time they want. You talk about people who do some or all of their product lines. We have a customer who every week develops a new flavor because they were asked to develop a new flavor. Let's say a mango, pineapple, kiwi de -de -de flavor. <laughs> all right. It's an artificial flavor, but they have to develop it. Right. Because this is the first time somebody asked for it. They come to us, we do the review, we certify that additional product, add it to their certificate, and voila, they have their additional flavor certified for their particular customer asking for it. So is that sort of um, uh, an exception? Because aren't most uh, products, like, are they on like an annual basis? Or how often do you, do they expire, the, cert the certification expire? Yeah. Before? We make it very easy. We Our certification period is January 1st to December 31st. Okay. okay. It's not a mid-year or odd day of the month and from when you first came to us. When you first come to us, we do a proration of that first year on the product certificates and the facilities, but not on the reviews because it's a fixed price. Audit fees are a fixed price for the most part, okay, because it is what it is. But for the certification elements, it is prorated for that first year until the end of the year. And then we renew and bill for a full calendar year. Still add products as you go during the course of the year, and they're prorated for the rest of that calendar year. So it's easy to do. Yeah, that, that's the thing I think I also want to make very clear because we get a lot of entrepreneurs who watch, people who are you know, trying to develop food products, whether Muslim or not. And a lot of times people are really intimidated by the complexity and the cost of things being halal but i always tell them like it's really not it's not that bad at all and halal you know 
the the verification isn't isn't that it's not on you let the experts do their thing yeah it, it's not overly complicated and people who do this with other certifications whether it's non-gmo or organic and right. um, gluten-free paleo um, these things go through a process and and there is a, a timeline and and it's not really ultimately that difficult some are and i've heard that the kosher industry can be pretty demanding on on their things but you know regulations and standards are, are like that in particular and we'll talk more about the sharia whenever you want to um talk about the religious interpretations and approvals uh once the products are in the review session or um ongoing yeah, you can touch on that now because i think that's a good good a good uh time to talk okay. about that well we do have a sharia board as most um halal certifiers will and these these religious experts are often very well educated they've either studied at El Azhar in in Egypt or um, in Medina uh, and elsewhere so they're, they're, they're very well educated um, from a religious aspect so they can participate in the product reviews and those questions they participate in the audit facilities to be an observer and give a religious interpretation um, we talk about the various schools of thought for permissibility because among the four schools of thought, some accept some things, some don't. Exactly. Three out of four will accept a certain thing, and <laughs> only one will, or one will. It's a it's a mix. Ultimately, we're trying to uh, certify products for the particular market. Okay, exactly. a lot of products don't have to worry about the the schools of thought as to what's right. know, the standard or that, because it's it's straightforward. It's science and religion, and and that's that. But there are complex concepts of whether. You know, you can eat crickets, locusts are permissible, but what about crickets? And then getting a cricket protein powder yeah. uh, derivative, okay? We're not- Just come to the market. <laughs> so you know about ingredients and 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 whether or not they're they're okay. So we have that, that advice when needed by our Sharia board. And here's the real nice thing that we're proud of is that every Monday morning after our staff meeting or the last half of the meeting, we have a weekly thick course oh, nice. by our, our head Sharia advisor who we cover deeply, deeply. And it's been taking months. We've been doing it since last year uh, where we have about a half hour, 45 minutes about definitions and, and, and aspects of what is and isn't permissible. And it's huge. It's huge. It's, uh -oh. it's but it's really neat. We, we love that for our own, for our own growth personally. I love that. I, love that. I, I need, I need one of those in my life. Because I'm always interested in learning more. There's I, the more you learn, the more you realize you need to know. And you know? just when you thought you knew everything, you don't. So yes, exactly. And what's so interesting, what I love about uh, well, many things about Islam, but you know, we do have these four madhab, four schools of thought, and it's always interesting to me. Like when I post a picture of like a recipe for shrimp or mussels or oysters, which I love all of those. You know, I got a lot of people who are like, "Are those halal?" And I'm like. It just depends on the school of thought, you know. We we have such a, a broad range of what is halal, you know. It's like what is haram is not that much if you think really think about it, and it's not stuff that you would want to mostly eat anyway, you know. Right. So it's kind of interesting, like that. There's a plethora, and there are differences of opinion, but you know, overall, you know, we there's a lot we can have. <laughs> and then that's that's where it very simply comes down to it's a choice. You make a personal choice yes. between yes. you and Allah. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, depends how much guilt you can manage and, and whether you can justify it. Who knows? These are all, again, things that people can determine whether they want to accept uh, halal slaughter because it's a kitab as referenced in the Quran, or if it has to be strictly only a Muslim every time, all the time, in a certain way, facing the Qibla, any number of things like that. So. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and the, that is also that is a huge, um, you know, I've seen things go viral on Twitter about stuff like that. And I always avoid it because I think, you know, there are variations that we need to kind of address sometimes and, and not be so hard on people who have a difference of opinion within the parameters of halal. True. You know, you you believe that I believe that. But as long as we're not doing the haram, it's fine. You know, in my opinion. So, well, and that's just it. It's, it's sometimes it's cultural, 
sometimes yeah, it's exactly. um exactly you know the more you know the better decisions you can make hopefully and once again southeast asians uh, with their enormous you know the populations of indonesian malaysia in that area um they know what they want and they're yeah. and they have most of what they have in countries fine but they import so much yeah yeah for people yeah. who are on diets they want to take the uh, weightlifting supplements or they want to use a, a particular makeup or they they want to know if that that whey protein is halal and yeah um, I give them credit because they really care and you have to I mean think about well, you know something like toothpaste I mean when I got into this industry I didn't realize that there could be pork product in toothpaste and you're swishing it around in your mouth if you don't want to eat pork that's a problem and they have done such an excellent job of vetting everything that comes through. I, I think it, you know, in terms of caring about halal, like they, they just, they blow us all out of the water. We do have a uh, blog topic about things that are derived from pork. And it was taken from a TED, uh, TED talk by a lady, I believe from Scandinavia. She may have been Swedish, but in any case, she did um, a great TED talk about it. And there's well over a hundred different products from the bristles oh, yeah. yes. you know, for, your, for, for your makeup eyeliner or your hairbrush or toothbrushes and um, yeah. non-consumable things uh, and medicines and mm -hmm. so much that, that can come from there. And we have no idea. Yeah. So, yeah. It's interesting. Again, it's like how stuff works, right? It, it's people, I get so many non-Muslims who came to my book tour events because, which surprised me, um, but they were so interested in the transparency of halal and like, because I covered what's in your food as part of the book, they were just astonished at how much was, you know, it wasn't even really related to halal. It was just the fact that there's all these funny things in your food. And they were so appreciative to know that, you know, from just a general consumer point of view. So I thought, you know, that, that is true. You know, we all, we don't always know what's happening unless we're sort of digging into it deeper in this industry. So I'm glad that we have that out there. And we have multiple levels of customers, as I mentioned, whether it's the manufacturers who we have the direct relationship because we're certifying their products. There's very little, if any personal opinions in the process. Right. Because they're trying to make a product, trying to make it compliant and they're following rules and regulations that yeah. will serve their purpose and their market and their customers. Then of course we have the consumers who want to know because it's, it's very personal to them. And uh, once right. again, a testimony to manufacturers around much of the world, but especially in North America that uh, take it seriously to follow and, and comply. That, that's an important process. So you mentioned on your website that ISA assists companies in increasing global market share. So how, how do you do that for them? Because I think as a, if I was a business, if I had a food product um, and I wanted it to go global and I read that, I'd say, well, oh, these are the guys to go to. It's not only that they can make sure it's halal, but they can help me get into other markets. So how do you do that? Well, we talked about the importance of the halal logo mark. Right. Okay. And certain countries mandate that it has to have a halal uh, logo mark and not just any halal logo mark because certain countries in their Hello, governing bodies only authorize, approve, and acknowledge and accredit certain certifiers. So they're not even going to get into that market unless they have certification from us or others. Okay. And then at that point, they have to have the logo use. So mm -hmm. the visibility of it, that that that's an educational thing as to why that's important for compliance purposes, not just because it's contractual uh, between us. Uh, during our educational seminars that we attend, during these types of discussions, during the questions that we feel from people, we're always trying to stay on top of halal standards, which can change from time to time. Um, we do have overseas contacts in certain regions that can help them as distributors of the product, okay? They wanna get their product into a market, but they don't know how to even start. There are programs through um, the US uh, Trade Export Type Commission. There's I can't think of it, but there's an export library in the USDA website. There's other mechanisms that if you find out and look it up locally, they'll help you with marketing in certain countries, whether it's dairy products, like uh, agricultural things. So um, poultry and egg council, dairy council, a lot of these different companies, and we'll help point them in that direction. Right. So that, that, that helps them leap 
uh, to the next level. But I think basically our travel experiences, uh, attendance at these these industry developments, and then more importantly, as I love to call it, just the client relationship building and maintenance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, a number of us know these customers and QA people specifically or regulatory by first name. Yeah, yeah. You know, hi Bob, hi Jane, hi Mary, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And they'll come and ask us questions or we'll we'll share information because we know it's part of their industry, whether it's a chemical industry. It's like, oh, there's been a development in this industry and we like to share that. Hence the blogs, hence the Halal News, hence right. picking up the phone when it rings. OK, answering that email in a timely manner that that value added service um, hopefully speaks volumes. And I did a seminar just on the value of customer service from a halal perspective and how it helps everybody. Yeah, I love that you're not only uh, fielding those questions, but but the website is so transparent that there's so much there, too, because it's it's not hidden from people. It's it's very much. Uh, you know, a resource. And that's what, you know, anybody who's trying to get into this space, it's helping them to not be deterred from getting that halal mark. Because some people might say, well, Mm -hmm. everything's so difficult. But when they go to your site, they can see, well, everything's laid out nicely, professionally, and clearly. And you guys are an amazing resource for pointing them in whatever directions they need. Because I get asked all the time to questions about, you know, distributors, how to get into the US. And it's like, where do you start? There's so much information and that's not really my, uh, you know, cup of tea. So you guys I are. Think part of it is that um, we have to understand there's a lot of people with great ideas. Yeah. There's entrepreneurs. They <laughs> want to come up with a particular product. Uh, we had a customer come to us and I said, what a great idea. And I don't want to talk about the topic because it's such a great idea. It's really Hopefully they're going to follow through with it. They, they just yeah. didn't really know how to market it, but the concept is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. It's a brilliant concept, but they don't have, run a manufacturing company. They don't make the product. They have an idea. Yeah. So they want to go to a third party or get leads and understand who makes right. this type of product. Okay. Right. Right. When you think right. of cereal in the cereal aisle, there's Post, there's Kellogg's, there's General Mills, and then there's the, the, the great value Walmart brand. Um, some of these companies are using the same third-party manufacturer. They just put a different private label. There are manufacturers out there that specialize in the production of a particular product, and they can, with the contract, use your logo, your mark, your brand, and place it on the product. And can you really tell the difference? Sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. I know that my post-grape nuts cannot be replicated by any other generic brand. I'm sorry. But... (laughs) Corn flakes or Cheerios, those types of things. There, it's just yeah. another name on it. Okay, so business uh, advice. That's I just want to really finish quickly. Sorry, is that it's important for those third-party manufacturers to understand that there's value in being halal certified themselves. That way, they can say, "I can produce anything for anybody because I'm a halal certified facility. Exactly. I know how to comply. I know how to make this, and that just blows open the doors." for the people who seek the third party manufacturers as well as for those third party manufacturers. Now, of course, we would have a private label agreement for that third party private label to have with us so that they would have the right to use our logo on their products, receive their own certificate, naming their product by the brand and the type. You can't write on the coattails of the manufacturer because they're just the manufacturer. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. But yeah. I wrote an article about that a couple of months ago on our blogs. Again, there's a wide range of things you can can find, kind of like a, a bibliography of uh, things that might be of use. It's almost like you're you're also a, a business resource for people because, I mean, initially people might think that they would just come to you because they already have a product, but in reality they can come to you to kind of get the whole, you know, idea of getting started and and moving through the process and even if they don't have a food product but they have like you said a facility they're also they can also be a client of yours which is probably growing in demand i would say if halal products are growing in demand then we need places to to um, manufacture them or to to facilitate the packaging all of that packaging correct or there could be a packaging aspect where something is then made 
and it's send in bulk and then it has to go somewhere else to be spray mm -hmm. dried or exactly. liquefied and then put into containers that are appropriate for that type of finished product. Right. So and it's that, a long chain. And yes, once again, it's education. Where does my food come from? How is it made? What's it made of? And who made it? Yes, that's that's my MO all the time is where do you know where things come from? Do you know where, you know, it's not just the farm. It's also the packaging. It's the it's everything. So. It's animal welfare. I mean, it goes back to Temple oh, Grandin and how the animals treated right. before slaughter, during slaughter. Yes, um, exactly. There's a lot of neat stuff. So we can solve all the ills of the world. We'll just have to make this a weekly event. But yes, uh, with the tea, with just a show, we can we can do that. We can conquer that. I have a million gazillion ideas to discuss, and I can be here all day. I so. hope we still have a, um, an active audience. Uh, we haven't seen any QA come up and. I know yeah, sure. you'll be asking for that, but can you tell how many participants we have today? Have you seen that someone is asking a question about a sustainable, we have a sustainable oral care business. Do you certify this type of business? TwiggyFresh.com. Uh, certainly. Call us. Why not? 319-362-0480 okay. or visit our website and apply online that way. When I'll put the website again and people can... Uh, yeah, and I think you let Omar know that, uh, but we'd be happy to talk to him about uh, about his products because yes, that fits with the the lifestyle products, the 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 cosmetics, the the, the supplements, the health and wellness industry. Big deal, big deal. Okay, one last thing I'd like to touch on before I let you go because I know you're a busy guy and you have lots to do. But I really um, I liked the part of your website also that. You, where you talk about your partnership with HMCA or Halal Montreal Certification Authority. I was just in Canada for the Halal Expo there, and mm -hmm. I love Canada. I love I love the industry there, the Halal industry. The people were great. Um, I like what they're doing. I like the products. I like the services. So this really caught my attention. So can you tell us more about the partnership and then, you know, how how important is that? How what are you doing to work together? What what influence does that have in the industry? Well, we knew um, through our Halal conferences and events, um, the owners of Halal Montreal Certification Authority based in Montreal, uh, and, and the opportunity came up in a discussion and we pursued it and we had the opportunity to purchase them um, because they had established a business and were ready to, to sort of move on. And, and I think that's really important for any company, let me just put it that way, that you need to have succession planning, okay? Not everyone needs to, I mean, but if you wanna continue from a, a smaller business aspect of how do you continue the business? Who's gonna take over and do what you've done to create and establish that business and, and serve the customers? So we have the opportunity and we mirror the same standard operating procedures we have at ISA. We've um, been able to extend and expand our reach for customers who are multinational companies that have businesses both in Canada and in the USA. And, um, you know, that's, that's not where the, our vision ends. We, we look to, uh, to overseas markets where we can establish uh, uh, potential to serve customers along with uh, somewhat partnerships that we have and friendly partnerships, I should say, with other certifiers, because if we can't certify in a certain country in Europe, and it's required that the certification exists there in order to enter Indonesia, that it has to follow the the, the country of origin where the products are made. We we work with with each other and, and trusted partners to say, hey, uh, we have a customer who has a need and an interest for their facility in that country. But there's there's more opportunities to uh, to serve everybody across borders and other markets. Certainly is such a global industry. That's what I love about it. Is. it. You know, we, we can't be isolationists. We can't no, live in silos. No way. No way. I I think that's the beauty of it. It's the beauty of the Oma. The Oma is global. It's international. It's uh, you know, it's so varied and so interesting. And that halal just sort of follows that. I mean, that's just uh, the nature of it. And it's very interesting how things can be done differently, but all halal. And um, you know, we meet so many cool people. Yeah, they're doing really cool things. And I think it's just getting more and more interesting as more and more people are entrepreneurial around the planet. And I'm, I'm right now I've been seeing some things going on in Africa and I'm like, wow, this is, this is interesting. 
this is not something we haven't seen before. People are more and more entrepreneurs coming out of Africa. So I just think that um, the, the future is really bright in the halal space. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And I have to say, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the travel to these conferences, of course, yes. learning and having the opportunity to uh, be in the front row, but to be alongside our colleagues in this industry. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you, you know, people from Brazil to Australia to yeah. to uh, to Britain, to France, to Vietnam, to South yeah. Africa, you name it, India, Sri Lanka, all these people we have were friends and brothers and sisters for life. OK. Oh, yeah. Uh, that is that is really to me really touches my heart. I love it. I love really? it. It's growing into spaces that aren't, you know, traditionally Muslim, like Japan and Thailand, and that gets me exciting, excited too, because, you know, I, I I love traveling no matter where it is, but to be able to, you know, to feel welcomed and feel like, hey, they they recognize halal, and like Japan's airport now, they're you know talking about, I think they've done a lot of things there in the Tokyo airport to um, facilitate travel for Muslims. Like it's just. It's a fascinating industry. That's a whole other topic too, halal tourism. Okay, that's yeah. not a new concept. No. And Japan was preparing to host the Olympics yes. a couple summers ago, and that really hurt them uh, with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise, they had they were preparing to make it a Muslim-friendly, halal-friendly yes. country yes. from hotels to foods and, and the yes. convenience of being able to entice visitors from Malaysia and Indonesia right next exactly. door, practically. Exactly. Very come, and whether it's the Olympics or anything else, uh, they have money, they want to travel, mm -hmm. and they want to be able to have hello beaches and facilities for their families, hello yeah. friendly. That's the next uh, project that I'm interested in, too. So, so do you see in the future maybe certifying uh, hotels and restaurants, for example? Um, that already is happening in some of those markets, as you said, like Japan and Korea, um, that are forward thinking. Okay. They're very visionary, uh, restaurants. I'll just give you my opinion that it's very difficult here in the States to have a fully halal certified restaurant because you have to have everything in the restaurant halal certified from mm -hmm. the mayonnaise to the seasonings, to the daily, um, starches and, and things that yeah. the, the staples I should say mm -hmm. and it can be done but who's going to monitor it on a regular basis sure. in Kuala Lumpur there's auditors all over the place for Jakim they'll pop in and surprise visit but the majority population is Muslim so they do it they have to and they will uh, right. for regional areas and restaurants we have something that's called a, a verification program that attests to and monitors and knows that they are sourcing at least their meat and poultry from halal certified, reputable, known certifiers, uh, you know, with more than the benefit of a doubt that yeah. we see the certificates and we say, we know at least you're sourcing that, but to state that it's halal all the time, every day, all day, unless right. you have someone that can pop in and visit anytime and multiple times a year to make sure that the inventory, the cleaning, the handling, that there's literally no pork. We, I, you've, any of us have gone to halal restaurants, halal restaurants, Indian or, or ethnic ones, and you ask, is the beef halal? Yes. Is the chicken? No. Right. Or vice versa. All our chicken is, but not our beef. Or, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's hit and miss. So don't assume that yeah. that's the case. Or you go to a Middle Eastern restaurant, and on Saturday nights they have belly dancing. Okay. Is the halal restaurant halal then? I mean, you decide, okay? Yeah. But it's, Most they have alcohol. They have a bar. And so you can't do it. Okay, you can't. It's yeah. Tough. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that there's just more room to grow. That means there's more business to come. There's more wait, wait, Alhamdulillah, we're not I don't see us being out of work anytime soon. That's great. No, no. So if the youth if the youth are interested in becoming food scientists or in the business of halal tourism, and I think there's there's work. There's definitely work for them coming up. So inshallah. I think it's great. It's it, the it's it's an endless opportunity, um, one that most of us do not do or would not do or should not do if we don't feel it. Absolutely. You don't believe in it. Yeah. This is not a data entry job. This is not a nine to five. Pick up the phone, answer a general question. We want to go above and beyond. We have um, a fiduciary and religious and other obligations um, to do this right and to do it with heart. And I can tell you. Uh, there's a great deal of passion in our company uh, for this. We're we're very 
very vocal amongst ourselves <laughs> and how to do it better every day. So, well, I, I, I just had a conversation with some folks this morning about that. And I was addressing the issue of, you know, um, the values based system that we're in and how, you know, you, you really can't be in this unless you care so much. It's such a heavy responsibility. And, you know, it's something I, I think you really have to love because it's a lot of, a lot of work, <laughs> and, but it's and, good. And we're responsible. We act as agents for these other yeah. countries that are importing or yes. uh, accrediting us and, and holding their trust in us for, for their countries and their, and their populations. But it can be very rigid. There could be a lot. It's very demanding. It's not as easy as I've de depicted or portrayed here every day because there's ISO standards. There's yeah. standards that are put forth that we have to maintain for this country or this region according to right. Turkish or UAE or Saudi. And, and it's yeah. just become more and more difficult, more and more costly, more and more time consuming. And we have to be experts in these fields. But I can tell you that um, our staff, and we talked about this at the beginning of the discussion about food scientists, that um, they're qualified because they have a background in biology, microbiology, right. chemistry, right. Uh, agriculture, uh, agronomy, whatever the case may be. They, we have people who are experts in different lines. And I've learned as I've gone, but I, I'll never be able to consider myself a full expert. But over time, you learn what it takes. And and we're yeah. not all religious scholars. We may be Muslims, but we need to um, continue honing our skills and our resources. It takes a village, right? Of, of, of really qualified, really educated people to, you know, not one person can be everything. That's why we need each other. And it is a huge responsibility. And it's not something that people can just start up and then start smacking labels on things. You know, the, this is not, not okay. Well, thank you for what you do because you help uh, spread the word, so to speak. You your your topic materials are varied, varied and um, and fun and fun. So, uh, and you've been doing it for a while. I don't know how long you've been blogging, but I know my Hello Kitchen's been for a while. Can you believe it's been fourteen years? I can't believe it. I feel like it's just oh. been yesterday. <laughs> now, was that your business itself or the blogging aspect too? The true publicity and marketing, all of it. All of it, all at once. It was all at the same time. I mean, I never intended it to really be, uh, uh, I mean, I took it seriously, but I never intended it to be like an entrepreneurial endeavor. I just really wanted to write about food and travel and halal because I felt people just didn't, you know, on both sides of the coin, like we need to know more information and reduce, like get, eliminate Islamophobia and all of that through education. And my MO was always just, you know, getting the word out about who's doing what in halal and promoting all these great things that I see. I just love, you know, to, to tell people about people like yourself and your organization, because you're such a great service, just like, you know, people who create great halal products, like people need to know about them. That's, I'm very passionate about doing that. Um, because I know I don't do what you do. I can't do what you do. And I, you know, I know my, my space is, is in this like voice, you know, and I, and I love being that, but I, but having known people like yourself who are in this space, it's, I, you know, I respect the amount of integrity and hard work and just focus that it takes to do something that, you know, is such a responsibility as putting a label on products. So you are a pioneer in this, uh, just as I say, we consider ourselves a pioneer, a yes. certifier of North America. I yes. mean, really the first the first one. I mean, Absolutely. people may want to dispute whether it was what a halal business right away in 1975, but it evolved very quickly and mm -hmm. it did precede others. And uh, yet we, we share the, uh, the glory of the industry with everybody else, regardless. It's not yeah. about who was first, but no. or best. It's, it's, it's still a matter of doing it because it's a passionate thing. And I think this medium of seeing people and hearing them rather than just reading is a big deal. We all know what TikTok and Snapchat and things that I don't have are doing. Right. And, and it's excessive because it's, it's, it's extreme in other ways, but as long as you can learn something and yes. you can see it because people are visual, mm -hmm. uh, they don't always have the time to read things. And yet, you know, your articles uh, that you've written for Salam Gateway and others, um, you know, are, are a big deal, but this is, this is the new, 
this is the new best way to do it. And then in addition to the other ways of doing it. Yeah, um, I think we have we blogs. mixed media right now. We're, we're doing everything we can. And that's, you know, if the more people get educated about this space, I think the better. More people can join the space and provide, you know, bring their expertise to it. And also just get information out there so that um, I just really want halal to be uh, respected and um, normalized in this country and around the globe, but particularly here at home. Well, we hope, inshallah, we can accomplish that. And once again, the medium hasn't, it isn't new because Steve Jobs did these things and uh, there were always recorded seminars and talks, but um, we know what counts for us and that's important. Yes, exactly. Well, if I'm ever in Cedar Rapids, I would love to come by and see you guys at the office and maybe have a We tour. have a great facility. We have a beautiful yeah. facility that uh, we moved into and updated a few years ago. It's, it's, it's just great. And I do miss the old days of being in one office. We have a lot of people remotely, but uh, the old days were fun because you could get out on the floor, have yeah. a conversation, get it done and move on without... Yeah. You know, the email, but we use MS Teams and all these things pretty often to uh, yeah. do a face to face and a voice to voice. So. so you get to be in sunny Arizona in the winters. Yes. Yes. So, yes. yes. I think, I yes. think you're the envy of the office in the wintertime. <laughs> I, I, I got to be mindful of it. I, I always check the weather in Cedar Rapids and uh, yeah. empathize with them with what they're going through. But um, then again, we pay for the heat. But uh, yeah, that's true. Summer, but but that's yeah, I don't want to rub it in too badly. But we have choices. Let me just leave you with that point. Sure. Okay. We all have we all have choices. You need to follow your dream. Okay. Yes. Everybody has a story, a yes. background. How did you get here? How did you get there? When you're yes. traveling overseas and you're on a plane or wherever you are, it's like, what was their life about? What you know? What did they go through? And those who are dealing with hardships. Now we're turning into a a philosophical, sociological. Well, I like it. Please continue. That's great. I, I, you know, you look at people who don't have what we have. You know, mm -hmm. the homeless, the 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 drug addled and the addicted, and circumstances that happen, and yet there are those that have risen above, and and have managed to achieve what they want mm -hmm. uh, because they really, really tried hard in the face of adversity. But ultimately, it comes down to choices. Follow your dream, live your life, and uh, respect everyone who, because everyone has a story. Yeah, that's so true. I'm so glad you you brought that up because, uh, you know, typically I I like to get, I like to get perspective from people like yourself because you got here for a reason, and we don't always get to figure out why. We don't always get the sort of secret sauce, but I guess it must be your mindset. Um, and and some good fortunate. I mean, it is blessings. I never say I'm lucky. I don't use the word lucky. I don't either. You can't I mean, say it's luck because that's dumb luck. It's it's faith. <laughs> it's it's faith. It's it's, yes. it's blessings. Yes, definitely. I always say, you know, I wouldn't be in this space unless Allah wanted it, right? And um, I just real quick in the very beginning. Um, when I started the website, I actually lost the whole thing. The first, after a year of doing it, the entire thing <laughs> disappeared by because I played around with something and I pressed one button and I lost everything. And then I went back and I, I said, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be. I should have prayed istikhara. I should have asked Allah first. Should have, should have, should have. I didn't think of that. I just went into it and thinking, okay, this is the right thing to do. I went back. I said, oh, Allah, I should pray Sakara. I prayed to Sakara. And a couple hours later, the tech guys from the hosting company came back and said, we don't know what happened, but we were able to get everything back except a few photos. I'm sorry wow. about that. Wow. What a I, miracle. But it was such a lesson that, you know, this is not, I mean, I truly believe like in this halal space, um, it's it's more than just business. It's it's divine, you know, it's, um, I believe, you know, I have a responsibility and if I'm not good at this, I, you know, Allah will take me out of it. Hopefully just, you know, if, if, if my intentions aren't great, you know, like I always I try to be mindful of all of those things because it's, it's bigger than myself. It's bigger than any of us, right? It's going to be here when we're gone. So um, I don't take it as my own, you know, personal doing. It's not, 
me who did it. It's with Allah's help and the help of this entire community. So um, that's just how I look at it. But but um, not to get theoretical or anything. Just, don't 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 discount the uh, the drive and the initiative that you put forth into it because it also just doesn't happen by itself. True. I mean, True. You know, people but, want things and it's not going to fall into your lap. There's a lot of, uh, you get motivation and, and you got to make it happen. Sure. Sure. So, you know, yeah, I, I, that's true. That's true. It's just that it's, um, I feel very blessed and fortunate to be in it and meet people like yourself. And this is an honor for me. I get so excited and happy because I learn something all the time from, from my guests. And um, now I've learned so much more today from you and I appreciate that. And I appreciate how transparent you've been. Like I said, it's I haven't spoken to a certifier like this until today. So thank you for being the first and hopefully others will follow. And They're out there. They're out there and I know they'll, they'll talk. <laughs> um, I know they'll offer their, their insights and opinions, but it's a matter of time. And But this was valuable for us and this, I enjoy this part. I enjoy yeah. the relationship thing. So thank you for doing what you do and for that continuous knowledge on your website and blog and um, all that I encourage everybody. I'm gonna when we hang up. I'm going to put a link to your blog aspect of the website so people. Oh, thank can you, thank you. Resources, but this uh, replay, this the, the replay of this uh, uh, interview will be on YouTube at my uh, YouTube.com/slash/myhellokitchen. Uh, Excellent. Tomorrow, so it'll be in perpetuity on YouTube and on our website. And so people can watch it and please share those of you who are watching, share it with your friends, your family, anyone you think would be interested in it. LinkedIn, because we have a lot of professionals on LinkedIn who are in the food space, the supply chain space, the halal space, obviously, but more people than you think will be interested in this. We'll, we'll promote and have a link um, on the, on our own website and I'll uh, have it added through a partner at uh, the Halal Times uh, based out of uh, Tokyo, and yeah. we'll we'll see what we can do to perpetuate it as well. But this has been really fun. I think. Um, uh, are there others that actually have any questions that haven't asked them verbally or in the in the in the chat space? Umar is uh, is a big fan, it. obviously already. So it was really intense. I think he's got a product that he wants to talk to you we'll about. We'll reach out to him. We'll reach out to him very yeah, soon. Too. But uh, but I'm glad he's enjoyed it. I hope uh, there's others that are out there. That yeah, there will well. be. A lot of people just don't, so, they get a bit shy about asking questions. But very exciting. I will forward anything to you that comes my way. And uh, anything else, Tim, that you want to mention that I didn't ask or you didn't get to talk about? We, we, we covered a lot. As I said, we can make this a monthly, quarterly thing. I'm kidding, but I, I'd be happy to uh, chat more with you about any topics and somebody should be interviewing you about um, the things that you do because uh, Halal Tourism, Halal Attire, it's a lifestyle. And, yeah. and in one of my other presentations, uh, I asked the, the, you know, the rhetorical questions that is it a bit? Is halal a business? Is halal a you know religious obligation? It's really all of the above. It's a way yeah. of life. It is. And, um, it is. And, and and the Southeast Asians that they believe in Malaysia, they they say halal is my life. Indonesia says that halal is my life. You know, they, they, I, it's, it's a big deal. I've yet to visit those places, but they're on my list. I I really think that it's about time after all these years to. Inshallah, I, I hope there's a return to those types of conferences and the. Yes, yes. I really do. I really do. I miss that. And then we can all meet in person. It's great to do that. Inshallah. Inshallah soon. Inshallah. Well, best to you, Tim. Thank you so much again. And I think uh, we can do this again soon when you have, there's more to talk about always in this realm. So I'll think of something. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank have you. a great rest of the day. Take care, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you. Bye -bye.